Thank you, everyone. I'd now like to call to the podium Attorney General Kenneth Polit for some closing remarks. Let's welcome him to the stage. Good evening, brothers and sisters. Good evening, brothers and sisters. I'm here to bring us all back together tonight, all right? We have gathered this week to proclaim our shared commitment to combating corruption. Indeed, I have shared your commitment throughout my entire career with the Department of Justice, first as a prosecutor in New York, later as a U.S. attorney in my hometown of New Orleans, and now as the Assistant Attorney General in charge of the Criminal Division for the Department of Justice. And you see, I've lived in a lot of different cities, just like a lot of you. And I consider myself a part of a lot of different communities where people believe that corruption is just a fact of life, where some claim that corruption is an inescapable part of their daily lives, that corruption is just something that they have to accept, that we have to accept, and that it will never change. Indeed, they have become insensitive to injustice. Well, I'm here tonight to proclaim that I fundamentally reject that notion. The Department of Justice rejects that notion. And I know each and every one of you here in this room rejects that notion. You see, I'm honored. I'm honored to be speaking to you on this day, International Anti-Corruption Day, a day where we seek to highlight the crucial link between anti-corruption and peace, and security, and development. Corruption's corrosive effects are global in scope with our communities, our people, often bearing the brunt of those effects. Corruption threatens our collective security by weakening our democratic processes, by empowering corrupt government officials. It stifles sustainable development by diverting funds meant to improve the everyday lives of our regular people, our citizens, and harming honest people that are just trying to play by the rules. The fight against corruption at home and abroad is a top priority of the Biden administration, as you've already heard from our national security advisor and from our Secretary of State. The White House announced that combating corruption is a core national security interest and released our nation's first ever United States strategy on countering corruption. The Department of Justice, our efforts to combat global corruption are constantly focused on how we can have the greatest deterrent effect. That is why we have dedicated a group of prosecutors, our public integrity section, along with prosecutors across our U.S. attorney's offices, focused on fighting official corruption throughout our United States. But we have also created specialized groups of prosecutors focused on international corruption. Corruption that has a nexus to the United States either because the corrupt scheme originated here or because those schemes made use of our financial system or because kleptocrats have hidden their stolen funds here. It is a fundamental cornerstone of the department's international anti-corruption efforts that international partnerships must be present. Without those partnerships, we cannot effectively take on corruption at home or abroad. So to our friends, to our counterparts, represented by so many of you from so many countries, many of whom I've had the chance to meet over this past week, I say thank you. I say thank you. I say thank you for your hard work, for your dedication, and for your cooperation, especially with our Office of International Affairs. You see, in recent years, we have coordinated our investigations and our prosecutions to fight corruption with, and this is just to mention a few of our partners, our colleagues in the United Kingdom, in Brazil, 
in Malaysia, in Switzerland, in Ecuador, in France, the Netherlands, Singapore, and South Africa. This international cooperation has been absolutely critical to the work of our Foreign Corrupt Practices Act unit, as well as the Cliptocracy Initiative launched by our Money Laundering and Asset Recovery Section. And even in the past few months, this cooperation has been essential to the success of our task force Klepto Capture, which is focused on Russian illicit finance. As we gather here this week, just this week, the department announced a $315 million criminal resolution with ABB Limited. ABB bribed a high-ranking official at South Africa's state-owned energy company to corruptly obtain confidential information and to win lucrative contracts. This was the Department of Justice, and I'm proud to share with you our first coordinated resolution with authorities from South Africa. Yes. Yes. And in addition, our South African partners have brought corruption charges against the government official, as well as their own corporate case against the company. To those who say that corruption is inescapable, I say our South African partners reject that notion. And so as this case demonstrates, the department is committed to growing our relationships with foreign governments to expand our fight against corruption into new industries, in new jurisdictions, including those whose enforcement regimes and anti-corruption laws are just emerging. Building those partnerships also creates more seamless and more efficient cooperation. Here in the United States, over this past year, we have brought charges against, among others, two former senior officials in Ecuador and Bolivia for alleged bribery-related money laundering. Three businessmen relating to an alleged bribery and money laundering scheme involving a state insurance company in Ecuador. Two former Venezuelan prosecutors, we hold ourselves accountable for allegedly agreeing to receive $1 million in bribes to not prosecute a corrupt contractor, and two former coal company executives related to an alleged bribery scheme in Egypt. To those who claim that corruption is inevitable, our partners reject that notion. No less striking has been our working in our fight against kleptocracy. You see, in the 11 years since it was created, our Money Laundering and Asset Recovery's Kleptocracy Initiative has repatriated more than $3.4 billion to foreign official, as a result of foreign official corruption and associated money laundering that is affecting the U.S. financial system. You see, you heard it. You heard it earlier from my sister Janet. Just a few weeks ago, we announced the repatriation of over $20 million in assets to Nigeria. These assets were stolen by the former dictator of that country and his co-conspirators. This brings the total forfeited and returned proceeds by the United States in this case to over $330 million. And you see, under an agreement between Nigeria in the United States, in the Ballywick of Jersey, of Jersey, the return funds will help finance critical infrastructure projects, including bridges and highways and roads, investments that will directly benefit citizens across Nigeria. You say that corruption is unavoidable. My Nigerian sisters and brothers reject that notion. And we haven't done it alone. We haven't done it alone. You see, in the 1MDB scandal, for instance, billions of dollars were stolen from a Malaysian sovereign wealth fund that was purportedly created to promote the country's economic 
development. It took a global coalition, including work by Malaysia and Singapore in Switzerland, in France, in the United Kingdom, among many others, to return and assist in returning over $1.2 billion to the people of Malaysia. And our work continues. Over and over again, our international partners are rejecting corruption as a fact of life. And you see the strength of those international relationships they are being tested like never before in responding to Russia's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. Part of our international response has been to shine a bright spotlight on the corruption in the illicit finance of the oligarchs, in the enablers associated with the Russian regime. The G7, yes, it's important work, it's important work. You see, our G7 plus Russian elites, proxies, and oligarchs task force known as Repo has frozen or seized tens of billions of sanctioned assets and financial accounts, luxury yachts, real estate controlled by sanctioned oligarchs, and immobilized hundreds of billions of dollars more that are assets in Russian Central Bank. And here within the United States, our Attorney General announced the formation of Task Force Klepto Capture in March. That task force is marching forward with its mission. It has already seized several assets of sanctioned oligarchs and has brought charges against two companies and multiple individuals for the illegal sale and export of military dual-use technologies to Russia. These successes, these successes have required coordination across not just all of U.S. government, but with foreign partners dedicated to combating corruption. And we're not stopping there. The Department of Justice is just as committed to working with our partners to build international capacity to fight corruption. You see, our Overseas Prosecutorial Development Section, OPDAT, with support from Secretary Blinken, and the State Department's INL and CT boroughs post DOJ prosecutors at our embassies abroad to partner with foreign counterparts, to provide case-based advice and mentoring on complex corruption cases. IZITAP, some of you have heard of IZITAP. You have worked with IZITAP. That's our law enforcement development section. Likewise, it places advisors in partner countries to build the capacity of law enforcement institutions and other entities to investigate misconduct and corruption. As our department, we will continue to work tirelessly with our partners, but let me say in this regard, and let me lift up the essential work of civil society, of our investigative journalists, of our independent media, which by their courageous work so often provides the essential leads for our investigations and subsequent prosecutions. I've seen it over and over again across my, my career in the Department of Justice. One of the critical lessons from the success of our anti-corruption efforts is that law enforcement is exponentially more effective when we have folks like the people in this room standing along Side us. This fight is never easy, and that is why we need good people, good people like all of you, to stand up and say, enough is enough. You have to say, enough is enough. If you're in this room tonight, or if you're watching virtually, this evening, then you are part of this fight. Indeed, you are on the right side of this fight. Your service, your desire to improve the world now and for our future generations, your desire to make the world around you a little bit more fair, a little bit more just, is what makes our efforts against corruption in all of its forms possible. We must stand together shoulder to shoulder and reject the notion 
the corrupting idea that corruption is inevitable. Leave here strengthened by the relationships you have built at this conference, empowered by the spirit of this blessed anti-corruption day. Let us proclaim in one unified voice from every town, from every community, in every city, in every nation across this globe that we will combat and we will reject corruption in all of its forms. That, my brothers and sisters, is our calling. That is our calling today. That is our calling every day. God bless you all. I wish you all safe travel. Thank you all for having us. Thank you to Assistant Attorney General Polite for those powerful remarks and for highlighting the efforts of our hosts, the United States, including in my home country of South Africa. I'd now like to call upon Gary Kalman, Executive Director of Transparency International US. Thank you. Um, actually, before I jump into my remarks, it is, I just want to say that it is all too easy as we uh, work in Washington, D.C., and my great colleagues here that work in the chapter, and we go into legislative offices or go before the administration and we argue about language, about beneficial ownership uh, definitions or uh, specifics around the rules around engaging real estate sector, et cetera, et cetera, that sometimes it's easy to forget the stories and the real people uh, behind uh, the work that we do. Um, and watching uh, and listening to the stories of the awardees from the State Department and our own uh, champions and heroes in our own movement, um, if you're not moved by that, then I don't know what to tell you. Uh, it, is, it is truly inspiring and it is a privilege and an honor to be a part of this organization and this movement. So let me first say thank you to you all for reminding all of us uh, about why we do this work and the critical importance in people's individual lives. So thank you. Um, so, uh, I, I do want to thank you all for making this what uh, I've been hearing throughout the conference is a terrific success and for helping to make it so. I understand uh, from our founder, Peter Eigen, that this is in fact the largest IACC in the history of the conference. Uh, and that is very encouraging. It is an encouraging takeaway given the work that we have identified for ourselves. From the opening remarks of National Security Advisor Sullivan, um, who announced the administration's support for game-changing initiatives in the U.S., to Secretary Blinken's closing statements affirming the administration's continuing commitment to countering corruption and promoting democracy, this IACC sets the stage for critical work to be done in the coming years. The diversity of voices who have spoken in plenaries and workshops help us to better understand the challenges and the opportunities ahead to provide us with new avenues of coordination and the potential for increased political strength. I've seen several meetings and been in these meetings where I've witnessed new and expanded partnerships. They have been developed between stakeholders, including government, civil society, funders, and private sector. For example, the multi-stakeholder progress in the Summit for Democracy meetings I was in, providing a pathway forward um, for next year's second convening. It has been an amazing week and you all have made it an amazing week. I am thrilled and excited by the possibilities created and the new strength in relationships as a result of both formal and informal meetings. So thank you all uh, for, your encouraged, uh, for your engaged participation and thoughtful presentations and discussions and the commitment to continued collaboration. And I look forward to seeing you in the next two years to celebrate the progress toward the collective goals of fighting against corruption. So thank you.
Thank you, Gary, and really making his way up to the stage is Daniel Erickson, Chief Executive Director of Transparency International. He'll be making his closing remarks. Wow, what a conference, huh? As several have said, it's hard to get away from this without being touched or energized for our fight. So it's, a, it's really a big thank you to all colleagues, the whole movement, the whole anti-corruption family for, for being here and for all the discussions that we've had. And talking about discussions, we have been talking about corruption as a threat to democracy, democracy as an antidote to corruption. We have been talking about a paradigm shift with regards to anti-corruption and how corruption has become a question of national security. We have been talking about beneficial ownership transparency, asset recovery. We have been talking about the need to include the private sector to work with youth. The list is long and we know what we need to do. All of what I've said here is part of the high-level segment declaration. Uh, the, that high-level segment declaration was uh, the result of a meeting at the beginning of the conference with uh, 20 senior officials, heads of state, and representatives of international organizations. This is a tradition that we started with the Copenhagen IACC, and, uh, which has continued to this uh, IACC, and I hope that the next host, which I accidentally wrote the name of, but we haven't announced that yet, uh, uh, will carry on that tradition. You can take bets in the audience of which country will win. It's easier than the World Cup to predict, I suppose, so, this year. And uh, as, uh, as Gary already revealed, suitably for the US, this is the largest IACC ever. We have well over 2,000 on-site participants and many more online viewers. That is absolutely massive. Um, the IACC has been around for 25 years. And what I would now would like to, to mention is the fact that Transparency International as a movement has been around for 30 years. So none of this that we have experienced today, or the movement as such, would have been here if it wouldn't be for those individuals that kicked that off. And before I kick off the year that we will celebrate our anniversary, I would like for, uh, I think Frank and Peter are both here, I can't see anything, to stand up. Peter is here as well, the two Peters. Thank you so much. Yeah. They, they're all under 90, so we, we say that they're part of the youth program. Uh, or at least so Peter told me. <laughs> um, on that note, I will not hold you any longer, but um, I would like to invite my colleagues, uh, Ariana Kasman from Papua New Guinea, and Sanji Sinkala from Zambia to uh, read the conference declaration. Good evening, everyone. My name is Zanji Sinkala. I am an investigative journalist from Zambia. I'm one of the young journalists who have been covering this conference, and I am the communications officer at TI Zambia. Warm Pacific greetings. My name is Ariane Kasman, and I am the CEO at Transparency International Papua New Guinea. We are privileged to read the Washington Declaration of the 20th International Anti-Corruption Conference held on 6th to 8th December 2022 
themed uprooting corruption and defending democratic values. We, more than 2,000 people in person and more than 1,000 online, from 126 countries and all sectors and walks of life, gathered for the 20th IACC. We came together, sharing a sense of urgency and purpose. We have reaffirmed that we are united and that our collective actions are vital to respond to the global challenges we face for the future we want. We reaffirmed by strengthening our alliances, we will be able to confront the growing corruption threats from the rise of kleptocracy and authoritarianism to the climate crisis, from the corrupt driven political decisions to the growing violation of people's basic rights. We identified that as we grapple to recover from the social and economic consequences from the pandemic, existing and emerging conflicts across the globe bring to light how deeply rooted corruption is and how it threatens global peace, security, welfare, and the lives of innocent people. We acknowledged the urgency to redouble our efforts and to demand the effective implementation of commitments and promises made over so many years. During these four days of deliberations and debates, we identified new ways to root out corruption and promote more accountability, integrity, and transparency around the globe. Facing both crisis and opportunity, in support of this year's conference theme, Uprooting Corruption, Defending Democratic Values. We therefore declare that fighting corruption is vital to defending democratic values. Global corruption and its impunity are one of the prime sources of the multitude of problems affecting the poorest and most vulnerable countries and communities across the globe. States must restore and strengthen institutional checks and balances on power among executive authorities, legislatures, and courts, as well as through appropriate independent oversight bodies, ensuring government transparency and protecting media freedoms. Governments should be responsive to the people and public institutions and civil society must both be vigilant in preventing authoritarian overreach. Only when government institutions are transparent, responsible, and accountable will democracy prevail over authoritarianism. Trust in institutions must be restored. Many countries are plagued with grand corruption and state capture, weakening legislative and regulatory powers and oversight and enforcement functions. We need to work harder to ensure that politicians are more accountable and that civil society is capable to detect, expose, and counter undue influence by corrupt interests. States must also commit to ending impunity for illicit money in politics. Anti-corruption fighters must be protected. Those who speak out and expose corruption are in more danger than ever. We welcome the initiatives to provide more support to anti-corruption fighters across the globe, but this is not enough. Civil society, governments, and international bodies must recognize anti-corruption fighters as human rights defenders, especially those speaking up in dangerous environments. Governments must also roll back restrictions on freedoms of expression 
association, and assembly to ensure that civil society and the media speak freely and hold power to account. Global security is under threat now more than ever. We condemn how kleptocracies increasingly create regional and national humanitarian crises. From Russia's invasion to Ukraine, to the civil war in Syria, to the crisis in Ethiopia and the Sahel, to name a few. Governments must urgently end the use of their financial systems and as safe havens for the proceeds of corruption to stop kleptocrats and enablers who facilitate the flow of dirty and blood-tainted money. Just recovery from the pandemic should be corruption-free. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development continues to be key in coping with rising inequalities and the unparalleled impacts of the pandemic. Governments must abide by their pledges to include anti-corruption safeguards in public procurement and be transparent in their public spending. Anti-corruption efforts must respond to gender inequality. Gender corruption, including sextortion, hinders progress towards gender equality and violates human rights. Gender perspectives should be mainstreamed in anti-corruption public policy design, implementation, and monitoring to be effective. Environmental corruption must be countered. Massive investments are being made to address the climate crisis. The international community must work towards ensuring that these are not lost to corruption, including by supporting the engagement of civil society and local communities. A zero tolerance of corruption must be implemented. Human trafficking and organized crime must be tackled. Corruption and greed allow human trafficking networks to enjoy impunity and continue to harm innocent people. Governments, the private sector, international organizations must redouble their efforts and work together in engaging with and protect civil society and take decisive actions against criminal networks and those who protect them. Unscrupulous enablers must be stopped. Greed drives the insatiable and often corrupt pursuit of wealth, money, and power. The enablers who willingly facilitate safe havens for the corrupt and their illegally obtained wealth must be subject to heightened scrutiny and accountability, especially those who operate in luxury and dark markets. The private sector must be brought into the fold. While many companies have improved corporate governance and compliance, too many remain major contributors to the world's corruption pandemic. We urge all companies to take a zero tolerance policy towards bribery and corruption, including publishing the identity of the real beneficial owners of their companies and subsidiaries. Technology should be leveraged where appropriate to strengthen the fight against corruption. Governments should enhance digital governance and regulatory mechanisms based on the principles of transparency, accountability, and integrity, including for artificial intelligence, blockchain, and distributed ledger technology and big data. The key to success is collective action. There are no unsurmountable obstacles for this brave and committed anti-corruption community. Together, we will prevail.
Thank you to Ariane and Zanji. Now for our final speaker, please join me in welcoming Ruben Lefuca, Vice Chair of TI. So good evening, uh, dear colleagues. My task uh, this evening is to announce the host of the 21st International Anti-Corruption Conference. The ISSC remains a premier event which brings together actors across sectors involved in finding lasting solutions to the problem of corruption. The ISCC, as evidenced by the 20th edition, continues to grow in relevance, and many stakeholders have taken advantage of the spaces provided to engage in meaningful collaboration. But the organization of any edition of the ISCC is a long process with a number of important decisions to be made. And the first decision, first major decision that the ISCC Council makes is to decide on where to hold the next conference. The council is mandated to make this decision, and we have an elaborate process of identifying a host country. We receive bids from potential host countries, engage in discussions with relevant stakeholders in those countries, conduct on-site assessments of the capability of a host country. And in recent years, We've been to Athens, Greece in 2008, Bangkok, Thailand in 2010, Brasilia, Brazil 2012, Potrayaja, Malaysia 2015, Panama City in Panama 2016, Copenhagen, Denmark 2018, and for South Korea 2020, this was a virtual ISCC, completely virtual ISCC. And now we're in Washington, D.C. for the 20th ISCC. I was just reflecting that I've essentially picked the ISCCs that I've attended. And one cardinal feature is that in 2008, when I attended my first ISCC, I had a shiny black afro. <laughs> in Washington, D.C., I have a bit of hair, so I'm a bald ego. In 2024, I'll give true meaning to the statement that the board is black. So where does this journey next take us to? Where are we going to meet next? To network, to share experiences. Where are we going to have such a gathering? So the council has decided that the 21st International Anti-Corruption Conference scheduled for 2024 will be held in Lithuania. So, so congratulations to the government of Lithuania and all the stakeholders who have expressed interest and willingness in hosting us and making sure that we have a successful ISCC. May I now invite to the podium my Excellence Ambassador Audrey Pleptie, Ambassador of Lithuania to the United States of America, to say a few words of acceptance and to officially invite us to the beautiful country of Lithuania. So Ambassador, I'm sure I got your name wrong. I'll pay white goat for that. I'm sure you'll correct me as you come up to the podium. A big hand for the Ambassador, please. Good evening. Good evening to everyone, and thank you very much. And the outset, I would like to congratulate, first of all, all the awardees, all the recipients of awards. I mean, your work inspires us. And thank you. Thank you for your tireless efforts and leading by example. I know how sometimes it's difficult and dangerous to do that, but you do the right thing. I also would like to thank the U.S. government and Washington, D.C. for hosting this year's conference. 
It had at high level political leaders, best experts, civil society, and business representatives from all over the world. It was an forgetful week of meetings, networking, and looking ahead. It set high standards and expectations for future meetings, which would be very difficult to beat. Thank you. Thank you, all organizers, participants, for this leadership and inspiring discussions. We'll all agree that corruption is a cancer of our societies. It prevents economic and social advancement, increases disparities and injustice, feeds mistrust between people and institutions. No country, even the most advanced one, is immune. Everywhere around the world, we face new, more elaborate, and sophisticated forms of corruption. Corruption fuels up wars and authoritarian regimes, as we saw the case of Russian aggression against Ukraine. It doesn't respect the borders and frontiers. Therefore, our dedication, international efforts, and strong partnerships to fight these erosive effects of corruption are crucial. We have to work locally and regionally on state and international level, involving governments and civil society, private sector. Such conferences today provides us with the best platforms to tell our stories, to learn from each other, and to plan actions ahead. Therefore, it's my great pleasure and honor on behalf of the Lithuanian government to invite you all to Vilnius, Lithuania in 2024. <clears throat> Lithuania has made a great leap forward during the last three decades and has many things to share. In early 1990s, we broke away from thoroughly corrupt Soviet empire, so we know what is to live under full-scale corruption. Today, we are an EU, OECD, or NATO member state with advanced integrity, transparency, and accountability in both public and private sector. We are one of the leading countries in building strong anti-corruption networks, prosecuting corruption, strengthening prevention measures, and fostering anti-corruption values in the society. Lithuania has been a success story in getting rid of bribery in its public sector. It has one of the best whistleblower protection laws in Europe or most innovative laws on lobbying. We also lead the oldest and biggest anti-corruption cooperative network in Europe, which unites more than 100 anti-corruption authorities and police oversight bodies. Lithuania has come a long way in fighting corruption. But we know it is a difficult and endless journey with many obstacles and pitfalls. We know that only by working together we can hit the road and move forward faster. That's making our societies more resilient, transparent, and free of corruption. Therefore, we are very glad to host the NEST conference in Vilnius in 2024 and to provide the platform to continue this interactive dialogue and create so needed partnerships, which we've been building already for decades. Vilnius conference will once again bring together the brightest and the most prominent anti-corruption community members, heads of state, civil society, business journalists, NGOs, and all those who live to fight corruption and to make our societies better. It will provide opportunities to innovate further, to approach anti-corruption and transparency from a fresh perspective, to explore best ways how to use new technologies, open data, behavioral insights, and good examples that work in practice and inspire others. So while saying thank you to Washington, to United States, for this excellent week, for all organizers, speakers, participants, for inspiring contributions. We are looking forward to greeting you in Vilnius. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Martin.
So thank you very much. Um, my last task, I'm one of the privileged person to have two bosses. So I'm vice chair on the board of Transparency International and I'm vice chair on the ISCC Council. So it's my rare honor and privilege to call up my boss, the chair of uh, the ISCC um, Council, uh, Dr. Igetla Bell, to make the closing remarks. When Reuben calls me his boss, there's got to be something more coming, really. Well, you're great for having stayed all these long hours today and this week. And I was going to say, are you not ready to continue for another week? Because I might be, but I will not. I will not, I promise. Well, first of all, I would like to say on behalf of Council, on behalf of Transparency International, um, how we want to express our appreciation to the government of the United States for having hosted this conference at this time in such a special way. This is a very you know, special 20th uh, conference. And a, <laughs> and a very, <clears throat> a very special vote of thanks to the US State Department, uh, uh, State Secretary Blinken, especially the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs, as well as the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. This has been a very special group to work with, and we want to express our appreciation. <laughs> to all our speakers, moderators, you deserve our gratitude because you have contributed so much. And I think your names on the, on the, uh, on the conference uh, program brought more people than we might otherwise have had. So thank you so much for your contribution. <laughs> but you know, without all the participants that have come to this conference and those who are there virtually, um, we would have just, in a way, been talking to a very small group of people between each other. And now, we've got a very vast group of people going home, bringing with them the declaration that we have just heard, as well as all the private meetings that you have had. It was difficult to get into a room uh, because they were all used in addition to the meetings in the plenaries and the concurrent sessions. People were just coming together, learning about each other and making friends and developing new networks for the future. So thank you so much to all of you. But also to the staff of Transparency International and the US colleagues that work with them, to our interpreters, to the technical staff who really made the planning and the delivery of this conference possible. Without all of you, we would not be here today. Thank you so much. So in these past days, we've learned a lot. Uh, and I will promise you that I will not go over all the elements of the declaration, but I can tell you that I will take it with me. And I hope that you will as well. And keep it close to you uh, so that it can remind you of all the work that's ahead to be done and that we must do together. I have just three points I'd like to make. One is so much has been said about implementation. There is a lot already on the table that needs to be implemented. Let us do that. Secondly, we've been talking about collective action. And we know that this is not just a word. This is a way forward. And it's not only collective action anymore between government, business, civil society. It is that we must involve citizens of the countries, especially young people, but the citizens in all of our countries have to be part of the solution going forward. And also, um, I would like to uh, remind us that we, uh, as we come together, as we look at the theme of this conference, which is uprooting corruption, defending human rights, that 
the defending, I'm sorry, <laughs> defending our values, that there are essential values like human rights indeed, like the rule of law, like transparency, integrity, the respect for people, respect for citizens, respect for each other, that are really inherent in that group of values and there is much more that one could add. But this is something to remember as we look at the theme of this conference and that we uh, must, as we go forward, as we go home, that this theme should prevail on the way that we want to relook at our future. So thank you to all of you for being with us, for being together, and good travel back home. But please, let's make sure that the theme of this conference will prevail over our future. Thank you so much.